Hello everyone, uh, sorry I've been late, I've been actually stuck in my own little personal saw trap for the past couple of weeks. Um, you do not know how I was able to find the keys to this, but, I mean, I'm, I'm still kind of attached, it, it requires a separate key, but that's a whole, that's a whole other thing. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to talk about the Saw franchise, and before we begin my ode to Saw... I want to make something very clear. This is going to be a spoiler-filled vi video talking about the entirety of the franchise up until Spiral. I have not seen Spiral, but I do make some assumptions of how the next movie is going to play out. So whether or not I am correct is going to be purely coincidental. So I hope you guys enjoy this video that I put together for my ode to Saw. What is it about the Saw franchise that I just can't escape from? I feel trapped putting thoughts into words on the page for my love for this weird, confusing, convoluted horror franchise. I had never seen a single Saw film before this year, and my idea for how the Saw franchise was is essentially through second-hand accounts from people like YMS or Chris Stuckman or anyone else on the internet that had actually watched the film series. However, I wasn't allowed to watch the film series, and then I became an adult. And even then, I still had some hesitancy about the franchise, because at the time when I was younger, I thought watching a franchise that's nothing but schlock is, well, purposeless. But then I'm also kind of a fan of, you know, comic book films, but, you know, that's a whole other thing. So I decided, because we are about to get a brand new Saw film this year, I figure, let's watch all of them. Now, when I first started, I wanted to pace out my watching of the eight films in this franchise so far, the seven Saw-titled films, and then the Jigsaw film that was released in 2017. So I wanted to do two films a day for four days straight. Cut to 20 hours later, I have finished all eight films. I'm not joking here. Something about this franchise, I just couldn't understand why exactly I was binging this series. What is it about the Saw franchise that I was able to binge watch all eight films completely in one day? It is so weird to me because I never really do this kind of stuff with any other franchise. Sometimes when it comes to like say the Marvel movies, I don't watch all 24 of them in one sitting. I don't watch all of them in one sitting. I just pace them out over a few days. But somehow with Saw, with eight entries in its franchise, I was able to watch all in one day. So I decided to talk about why I love Saw in my video called An Ode to Saw. So starting in 2004 with the release of Saw, for as big of a grand design the whole franchise looked at a distance, when I first watched the first film in a vacuum, if the other films didn't exist, it's actually a pretty well done competent thriller. It's a low budget film of about $1 million in its budget, earning $100 million overall. It takes advantage of the fact that it's a small budget, and rather than focus on the big traps that the later franchise films would have in its place of character, it focuses on the characters. The original film was directed by James Wan, who would go on to do films such as The Conjuring, Insidious, and Aquaman. And it was also co-written and stars the film's writer, Lee Winnell, who would go on to make uh, Upgrade, which is the best version of the Venom movie, in my own opinion, and also the 2020 remake of The Invisible Man, which I also really enjoy. And in classic style for these two filmmakers, the budget for this film was $1.2 million, a relatively low budget for a horror film. Granted, horror films have been made with a lower budget than that, but considering the fact that this is a first-time film for both of them, in terms of, like, big studio produced films, 
it's probably the lowest budget they've ever done. And with that budget, they made a film that is, in all meaning of the word, iconic. I would say that a lot of the original film was that the film works kind of like Seven. However, there is some key differences. And yes, even like the filmmakers who have made these films have actually stated in the past that they were inspired by films like Seven. But the key difference between Seven and Saw is that with Seven, it was more focused on the killer rather than the victims. And that's where the key difference is where you frame your subject. Do you want it to focus purely on the investigation of a serial killer from the point of view of the cops? Or do you want it to focus on the victims and how they relate to the serial killer? And that's kind of where the first Saw really fits in that whole receipt. It's basically the same movie as Seven, but told from a different perspective. And that is actually a key part of filmmaking. Sometimes you could be inspired by other things and then put your own spin on it and create something as iconic as those movies that you were inspired by. Think about with Star Wars, where it was inspired by The Hidden Fortress and uh, Buck Rogers. It was inspired by these two sources of media that created the hodgepodge that we see as the original Star Wars movie from 1977. What makes this more interesting is the escape room aspect of this film. Honestly, in my own opinion, I think because of this film, it led to a rise in escape room popularity, but that's just kind of my own personal interpretation. I'm not entirely saying that there's a correlation between the success of the Saw movies and the rise of escape rooms that people have loved and enjoyed over the years, but that's that's just my general understanding. I, I'm kind of hyperbolizing here with that. In this section of the film, we follow Dr. Gordon, played by Carrie Elways, and Adam Stanheit, played by the film's co-writer Lee Winnell, as they are trapped in a dirty bathroom, a dead body in the middle of the room, and they have to learn about each other to try to escape Jigsaw's trap. Admittedly, this section is probably the most interesting part of the entire thing. Of course, there's other interesting aspects about the film, such as the superfluous trap sections that are meant to throw off the investigators, but are actually key clues to understanding who Jigsaw is as a person, and how he operates fundamentally on his psychological level. But the thing that people really do talk about, and even I am guilty of this as well, is that the film's twist is actually one of the most iconic parts. It's the part that people most, like, remember about the film, where the killer that we had thought to have been following is Jigsaw is actually not Jigsaw. It's actually just a random orderly that's at the hospital that Jigsaw convinced to be part of his game because he was blackmailing him, and the real killer, the real Jigsaw killer, was in the same room as Dr. Gordon and Adam Stanheit, which is just amazing it's actually a really cool twist and kind of puts a dour note at the end like adam just dies after that point we don't really see him anymore and when we get to saw 2 we see his dead body it's kind of sad a lot of this franchise has that same familiar end tone where it's the most sad ending for some of these characters that we do follow but also as the franchise goes on there is some changes that happen, and we'll get to those later. And another thing that this ending actually does is that it really implies that the actual situation that Adam and Dr. Gordon were in, as well as some of the other people, is part of a larger thing. Like, it's kind of Lovecraftian, but not really. <laughs> like, the whole construct that, like, Jigsaw eventually creates is just larger than everyone. But it also provides a lot of convolution because it's like it relies off of a lot of assumptions. It's like, oh, well, if this person does this and I'm going to do this and this is going to happen and then I'm going to do this. And a lot of the franchise is kind of like that after a certain point. And because of the success of the original Saw, obviously we, we would be getting more and more sequels as time went on. And from 2004 to 2010, that's kind of what we all got for horror films. If it's Halloween, it must be Saw, which was a typical tagline of a lot of the trailers for future Saw installments. And it became kind of like a yearly exercise, kind of like how the MCU does like three to four movies a year where people go to see them to like catch up with the story. That's eventually what the Saw franchise became up until 2010. <laughs> Blood. Out of all the Saw films, I'd say Saw 2 is one of the best films out of the bunch. It has everything from the first movie. It has the traps, it has the gore, and the bonkers twists 
that actually is amazing. This is the first film that Darren Lynn Bowsman, who would later go on to direct Saw 3 and Saw 4 and Spiral, this is actually one of the best Saw films of the franchise in terms of having to do the twists. One of the key things that this movie establishes is that one of the victims that was part of the Jigsaw Traps, extra traps, right, from the first movie, the reverse bear trap, Amanda, is actually also a co-conspirator to Jigsaw. And this isn't the first time we've seen co-conspirators. The fact that Jigsaw would have Amanda be a co-conspirator is actually a much more interesting concept. Because where the orderly from the first movie was just kind of like, oh look, it's a nice diversion, there wasn't anything intrinsic of why exactly he's part of the game. He was just kind of like, oh look, here's another piece to this puzzle. But with a character like Amanda, and eventually like Hoffman and Dr. Gordon, and later, you know, other people would be involved, it's the fact that Jigsaw's whole philosophy is based around rehabilitation. And that is where some of the more interesting concepts really come in to understanding the killer himself. Because Amanda was part of a trap and his whole motive is to basically try to make people appreciate life. Which is also kind of fucked up when you really think about it. It's like, why put people through hardship if the result is to be appreciating life? There's other ways to make people appreciate life. But like putting them through death traps? Sure, I guess. And the addition of Amanda really deepens a lot of the core interesting values of the Saw franchise, including how the Jigsaw cult even exists. Amanda's inclusion in this just adds more to how big of a web Jigsaw's whole plan really is. It's quite interesting. And the fact that she had to be put into another trap in order to successfully go through another game. There's multiple games that happen in this entire movie. But the thing that was awesome about this movie is essentially the reveal that the game that everyone was watching on the monitors when uh, when Donnie Wahlberg's character is interrogating Jigsaw was actually pre-recorded. The entire game was basically around Donnie Wahlberg's character having to stay still and be patient because a lot of his problems as an officer is in pretension to his essence of police brutality. He's not necessarily the kindest of officers and regularly goes off the handle. And as we see in this movie, he kind of loses it and almost beats the shit out of Jigsaw because he's not making any sense to him. And the most depressing part about this whole thing is that if he had just stayed there, <laughs> he would see that his son is just locked in a safe that was behind him the whole time. And that's what makes his whole, like, test the most depressing out of all of them. Is is that, like, he, sh he could have just stayed there if he had just been patient. But character flaws are character flaws, and Jigsaw knows how to poke at him. Which is actually a really interesting point to make, is that Jigsaw knows how to press buttons. Over time, at least. Now, that's not to say that this movie ha is great all around. There's still some stupid victims that, like, die in this movie. Like, you can't tell me that the girl who puts her hands in, like, the the, uh, the slice box, you know, like, having her wrists cut, her arms cut, to try to get the vial for the antidote for what she was experiencing, you can't tell me that that wasn't just a stupid character moment that was just used for padding. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a gory death, but, like, it's just random, right? And I'm not going to show what it is exactly because I don't want YouTube jumping down my throat. So, uh, moving on to Saw 3. Saw 3. Suffering. You haven't seen anything yet. From Saw 3 onward through to Saw 7, the overarching story begins where the last film left off. But another thing that will become a tradition from here on out is an early trap scene that sets up the entirety of the movie. When I first watched Saw 3, I thought the first trap was kind of superfluous to everything, but as the film goes on, you start to see the dichotomy between how J John Kramer handles being Jigsaw versus how his disciples take his message of rehabilitation and use it as a form of justice or pleasure even. It's kind of sadistic when you really think about it, and the entirety of the Jigsaw cult is that it's a cult. That's basically what it is. It's basically saying, in order to feel like you have to appreciate life, you also have to go through death. In, in terms of, you know, putting people in near-death situations, 
in order to appreciate life. And as I mentioned before, it's still kind of fucked up. Now the reason why I say that this film points to a dichotomy is that with Jigsaw's trap, or John, Tr John Kramer's traps, there was always an element of people being able to escape these traps. But this is the first film where it kind of lays down that the disciples of John Kramer don't necessarily care about the rehabilitative part, but essentially use the saw trap to basically get justice. And another thing is that they kind of rig everything because in the first trap of Saw 3, it was basically unwinnable. Even if the person had to get out of the chains that was attached to him, he couldn't even exit the door because the door was welded shut. Now, I will say that from Saw 3 onward also, the twists kind of become more and more ridiculous or even rehashes from previous twists. There's not a lot of big surprises that happen between movies, but the overall concept of 3 and 4 being tied together as one cohesive film is actually kind of the most complex thing I've, I've ever seen in a horror franchise. So, to start off with Saw 3, the film follows Jeff as he has to go through door to door uh, room to room to encounter people that were partially responsible for the death of his son who had been hit by a car while he was riding a bike. He comes across various people like bystanders or even a lawyer or even the person that killed him. And so basically his whole thing is that he has to forgive the people that put him through hell and had taken the life away of his son, which is such an interesting concept. Um, and to see him kind of like being this morally like gray person like he'll he'll like forgive other people but he won't forgive others it's just it's interesting and at the same time we also have amanda getting uh the doctor who just so happens to be the wife of jeff uh who's a nurse who has to keep john kramer alive because he's slowly dying of cancer which was established in the first movie as being kind of a brain tumor uh thing but here's the little kicker that makes this all the more anxiety wrenching is that she has a shotgun collar attached to her. Basically, it's tied to John Kramer's heartbeat. And as soon as John Kramer dies, if she can't save his life or something bad happens to him, she's dead. She can't get out of that that shotgun collar, which makes certain scenes like the brain surgery scene that happens in the movie all the more anxiety wrenching to me because it's just... Like, oh my god, it's just it's just crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's kind of crazy how the twists in this movie actually end up in the end. And ends in the worst possible way for any Saw victim. First, Jeff goes in and finds that his wife is shot by Amanda, for which Amanda gets shot by Jeff. In which Jeff is approaches Jigsaw as the final piece of his test to see whether or not he will forgive him for putting him through hell to go through the hell that he had to experience. And he fails that test. And in so doing, because, you know, his wife couldn't necessarily communicate with him at all, he loses everything. He loses everything. Not only that, but it's also revealed towards the end that his daughter was kidnapped as well and hidden in this facility where he is and because Jigsaw is dead, his wife is dead, he's left there not knowing where the hell his daughter is because if he had actually forgiven Jigsaw, <laughs> he would have known exactly where to find his daughter to escape, which is crazy and gets all the more punctuated with Saw 4's opening or Saw 4's ending because Saw 4 takes this in a it continues that story towards the end and it's just it's crazy you think it is over but the games have just begun saw 4 in my opinion isn't the worst film of the franchise but it does get to some really weird areas this is where i say we get into our first sort of era split where saw 1 through 3 is kind of the john kramer era saw 4 through 7 becomes kind of the hoffman era um where detective hoffman who was first introduced in saw 3 becomes part of the new jigsaw game he becomes the new jigsaw after amanda is gone he basically has free reign and this is also the same era where i start to think about why i started binging most of these movies because from saw 3 
onward, it becomes like an episodic series where the for where this film leads into the next film, leads into the next film, leads into another film. And it's through this method that it just allowed me to binge all these movies. And it does lead to some unsatisfying results because some of these entries just kind of end off on this really weird cliffhanger that's not even explained until the next movie. And there are some things that are set up in earlier installments like Saw 5 that pay off in Saw 7 and it's it becomes kind of confusing after a while to try to like piece everything together. And it's actually a really cool thing that we have like C uh, CZ's world who does like all these timeline things to like make sense of what every like what everything is and what is going on in the general timeline of the Saw universe. So thanks to CZ World for actually making everything clarified from here on out. The first thing about Saw 4 is the main game. The main game is following Lieutenant Daniel Riggs, or Rigg, who was part of the previous films, who would just kind of like barge in the places like head first. And uh, basically he has to learn to understand the Jigsaw Killer and to not go through doors because he has to understand the killer. And it, it, it's kind of a weird game for sure. And with this movie, we also get a lot more of the backstory for Jigsaw uh, or John Kramer prior to his uh, cancer diagnosis. We get to understand how he was able to fly under the radar from detection as well as uh, how he started doing his whole trapping rehabilitation phase of his life. We also find in this installment that the main reason for John doing a lot of this was due to his son dying at the hands of a guy looking for drugs at a clinic where his wife was working. Uh, his wife's womb was hit by like a door or something and she miscarried. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty sad. To which John eventually kidnaps the subjects involved uh, in an early test that kind of fails, but you know, the killer kind of dies as well. As for Lieutenant Daniel Rigg, his whole story is about having to wait patiently and not barge in impulsively, which ends up blowing in his face. Now, Lieutenant Daniel Riggs' whole, like, final test is for him to not go through a door, which just so happens to be a room where, uh, <laughs> where, like, the, one of the victims from Saw 2, uh, da uh, Donnie Wahlberg, his character, we find that he was kidnapped and put into another Saw trap, where he's being tested for not using police brutality, using a gun, and there's a lot of other like things happening in that whole storyline. But we find that that game in of itself is being played concurrently with Saw 3's game with Jeff. We also find that in the end of Saw 4 that Jeff from Saw 3 gets killed by a detective trying to investigate Jigsaw, and he himself gets kidnapped at the beginning of Saw 5, which is... It's a whole lot of things. And after part four, this is where we get into the Hoffman era from from parts five to part seven. Have you learned enough to trust me? The Hoffman era begins with part five, and I'm going to put a big disclaimer going forward. Even though the next three movies centered around Hoffman trying to cover his tracks, we also do follow back up with John Kramer's side of things in the past through Jill Tuck's interviews and through flashbacks with Hoffman about how he started this whole thing. Saw 5 feels like one of those obligatory episodes of the entire, like, franchise, or just an obligatory film to watch in the MCU. Think Iron Man 2, but it has so many different, like, things being introduced for, like, later films down the road, right? That's not to say that there isn't anything to learn from this movie. We learn how Hoffman operates and how he is different from Amanda in terms of being a follower. Where Amanda saw the light and started kind of like following the guidelines only to follow, fall from grace because she had her own prerogatives. Hoffman started by replicating a Saw style trap because of his time in law enforcement. And just like with Amanda, the traps are inescapable. The guy he puts in to die in the pendulum trap at the beginning was a person who murdered Hoffman's sister and got released five years into his 20 plus year sentence, who also happened to be sporting some really bad Nazi symbols, so it doesn't necessarily phase me that this guy would die because, you know, he looks like a neo-Nazi. Now this trap catches the attention of John Kramer who kidnaps Hoffman and basically tells him that 
you know, he knows what he's done, and he can basically blackmail, like, Hoffman at any point. And so, uh, <laughs> basically what happens, he, he, he gets blackmailed into helping him. And it also establishes that Hoffman was before Amanda in terms of his assistance, uh, his, uh, you know, his, his, his assistance in building these saw traps. And something that you'll notice, like, from Saw 5 onward is that it tends to do a lot of retconning where, you know, it's kind of like when you play chess against, like, a game that changes it, its rules every now and then, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to move my pawn here. And then the game goes, oh, well... <laughs> I had a pawn underneath the table that you didn't know about, and now it's next to your queen, and, you know, it, it took out your queen, basically. That's kind of how the franchise goes from Saw 5 onward, all the way through Jigsaw, with the appearance of new apprentices, new accomplices, new helpers, new this, new that. And yes, it highlights how big of a grand design that Jigsaw's plans are, but it almost starts to become convoluted, because it's like... It's like, again, it's playing against a person who just kind of cheats all the time. Like, it just feels cheap from here on out. And that's just my opinion of Saw 5 onward. Now, for me personally, from Saw 5 onward, because of also the flashbacks that we get, it takes away a lot of the mystery of Jigsaw. Like, part of the reason why Saw 1 worked, and kind of the reason why Saw 2 and 3 kind of worked, is that you still didn't really know much about Jigsaw, but you knew that he was so smart enough that he could basically trap anyone, right? And so from here on out, it just kind of makes him more, like, less mysterious. Like, it just makes the whole, like, thing more uninteresting. It becomes more about, hey, now we're going to, like, move to, like, getting justice for things, right? And also, there's also this weird thing where Saw 5 through Jigsaw kind of, like, becomes the most hypocritical thing ever, like, in Saw 5, Hoffman is told by Kramer to not make the traps personal. And then we get to Saw 6, which is a whole other thing, and we'll talk about it. But it's just, it highlights how the writing between different movies from here on out just kind of feel like they're passing the baton with no internal consistency. And I also blame the fact that these movies have to get out every single year. And that's why that was kind of a problem with the Saw franchise being a little bit inconsistent with its philosophies. Is that it doesn't necessarily maintain the same core philosophies or even try to understand new philosophies. It just says, oh yeah, he says this thing in Saw 5, eh, we'll disregard it. He has his secret grudge here. So it's like, <sighs> there's a lot of in internal consistencies and Saw 5 basically highlights a lot of that. Now, the the officer that was from Saw, 5, uh, Saw 4 that gets kidnapped, um, who uh, killed Jeff, uh, he basically is also trying to find out who Jigsaw's apprentices are, and he's on the tail of Hoffman. And his whole story leads to, like, one of the goriest, like, death traps I've ever seen, with him getting crushed compactor style from Star Wars, as Hoffman just kind of looks on and goes like, well... I showed you, you know, just kind of like that. It was just, it's weird. But of course, it wouldn't be a Saw movie with a separate game to follow. And this time, it's five victims who are all connected to the theme of justice. Uh, and they all have to work together, but they're all really stupid. Like, this is one of the stupidest, like, set of victims I've ever seen. Aside from Saw 7. And Saw 5's victims are just so blatantly just egotistical that it's just like... I have no empathy for any of these people whatsoever. And it just becomes superfluous to the main plot of Saw 5, which is the whole Hoffman dynamic. And, uh, yeah, I, I just couldn't get into Saw 5 as much as some other people did. And by the end of Saw 5, I just ultimately felt like this was a filler episode. It just didn't really have enough, and it was just in service to set up more things in Saw 6 and in Saw 7. Be saw. You will be put to the death. Saw six. Okay, so I gotta talk about Saw 6, because I think Saw 6 is legitimately one of my favorite Saw films. It's not better than 2, it's kind of in my top 3. So, top 3 is Saw 2, Saw 6, Saw 1. There's my top 3. Saw 6 has to be one of my favorite Saw films, mostly because of its interesting concept that could be adapted into a basic movie. But... Uh, the general thing about this movie is that it feels like a 
commentary on the American healthcare system. And that's not to say that it isn't because months later after this film was released, they were starting to talk a little bit more about the American Healthcare Act. You know, when you, when I watch this movie today, it's pretty obvious, like, whether or not it was intentional that they were having the discussion at the time, like, the fact that this story is still kind of relevant today blows my mind. I mean, it's unsurprising, but it happens. I'd say the most interesting part of the entire film is the stuff surrounding the main game focused on William, an insurance provider at Umbrella Health, which to me is a fun nod to Resident Evil, as well as a fun term for health insurance acting like an umbrella trying to cover you for all your things. Anyway, the thing that makes this one unique out of all the films is that the person being tested is similar to John Kramer, where both have a philosophy about life and death and choosing who lives and dies. Where John is more about the spirit of care and in terms of, you know, self-care, William is more about the numbers and pure greed of ensuring healthy people versus unhealthy people, placing a plural concept of healthcare into a binary concept, a black and white perspective, if you will. And for his game to twist the knife so that William actually has to see how his philosophy plays out is really fucked up and amazing at the same time. And it's not just random people either that he has to interact with in his game. It's people he had to work with, even people who wouldn't necessarily be covered under his own health insurance plan. I would say that the opening trap though doesn't really add much to the overall story, but it does show how Hoffman's and by extension John's philosophy in this isn't necessarily universal. As when Hoffman goes to the hospital to see the survivor that had to chop her own arm off, she gets kind of pissed off. She basically says, what's even the point of this? I had to chop off my own arm. How am I supposed to appreciate life at that point, right? <laughs> if I had to chop off my own arm, how how is this worthy? Which if one were to extrapolate and connect it back to the main game that we see, we could also see the entire thing being a critique of the entire system as being corrupt to believe that for those without healthcare, that it is somehow a blessing that they are going through a lot of pain that somehow makes them better people, when really it makes them more resentful towards those who harmed them. But then the biggest twist is that this game isn't fully about William. It's about the people he had rejected in getting insurance to ultimately have to pass judgment on him. Which is kind of fitting because John early in the movie is like, well, health insurance should be determined by the doctors and the patients, not the insurance companies. And so for this guy who is the head of an insurance company, having to be judged by the patients is actually kind of fitting. But of course, we still have the continuing saga of the Hoffman era, uh, who is now being pursued by Jill Tuck, the ex-wife of John Kramer. Uh, Hoffman is also on the run since the FBI is getting closer to him, uh, and he gets caught because of audio, like, de-splicing, which doesn't necessarily work in real life, but it's kind of fun. I like the scene where he gets revealed to be the killer, and it's like this weird tension-filled thing. Even though Hoffman as a character isn't a good character, you can still feel the tension in the room. Like, it, it's just good, I guess. And the film's ending is also kind of anticlimactic, I feel, though. Um, that's another thing I have against Saw 6, is that the ending feels anticlimactic in the sense that it leaves off on Hoffman almost being reverse bear-trapped in this reverse bear-trap 2.0 device. And yeah, the image of the final, like, shot of the movie is kind of haunting because Hoffman's, like, entire right side of his face is just torn off. But, like... I mean, there's not much you could really say that sets up much of Saw 7. And uh, let's talk about Saw 3D. Oh, joy. Game over. Saw 7, or the ill-titled Saw 3D, the final chapter, as the marketing would make it out to be, is pretty much towards the bottom of my ranked list. Not only because it feels like it has nothing to contribute, but it doesn't really have much else to do. This is the final showdown with Hoffman as the Jigsaw Killer. And while it feels like a lot is wrapping up, there's just one loose thread that just kind of ruins a bit of the fun of the finale. The film largely focuses on two different storylines. The first is obviously everything surrounding Hoffman v. Tuck. The other is 
the storyline of a guy who fakes being a survivor of the Jigsaw games, sells books that are about his false story, and having to interact with like all the other different survivors, the actual survivors of the Jigsaw traps. Which, by the way, if there was ever to be a Saw movie, I would have thought it would have been more interesting to have a Saw game where the actual survivors of the Saw traps would have to be brought back together again in some weird convoluted way. But I guess this makes sense. I mean, for Hoffman having to fake being Jigsaw, having to also now test a person who faked being a victim of a Jigsaw trap is kind of interesting, I guess. But the thing that was kind of confusing at first about this movie is the film's opening kill because it just feels like it just kind of comes out of nowhere. It's like... You know, it is a nice contrast to everything that we've seen before, where all the traps are in this, like, you know, dingy room that's, like, green or blue and whatnot. It's out in the middle of the open. <laughs> and I don't even understand the purpose of this particular test, because it's, like, two guys who had dated this girl. It, it feels it feels kind of wrong, you know? It feels like the most stupidest saw trap you could ever see. Because it's, like, there's no real purpose to appreciating life. Like, yeah, this girlfriend of theirs wasn't necessarily a good person. But what's the point of killing the person? How does that make your life any better? Like, I don't get it. I really don't get the opening trap of this movie, and it's really bad. Now, the thing I actually kind of like about this movie is that in some of the scenes with uh, the, the early survivors of the Jigsaw traps, it just kind of shows the effects of how John's philosophy had on people after well after he died. It's interesting to see you know, the after effects of how these people who were put through trauma basically responded to, like, living after the Jigsaw Traps. And, of course, the lady from Part 6 is in this movie as well, basically saying it's a bunch of hippy-dippy bullshit that they're saying that they appreciate life when she herself doesn't like it. Uh, but it's also where we get the reintroduction of Dr. Gordon, which is an interesting, like, thing to add. We'll get back to him in a minute, but it is pretty cool to see the original OG survivor, I guess, because from the first Saw, we didn't really see where exactly Dr. Gordon was, and in this movie, we kind of get some clarification as to where he was this whole time, which is an interesting twist for sure, I guess. The main game itself, I found incredibly boring, um, as the main hook just didn't necessarily grab me. Uh, yes, people do lie about various things, but by the end, it didn't really feel very surprising. No huge twist or anything, just a full-on punishment for Bobby and everyone around, it, around him who supported him. Plus, a lot of these victims that are in these saw traps are really dumb. There's one that's like, that is told to not scream, yet this person just kept screaming, and it makes no sense. It's like, you heard the tape. Why couldn't you just shut up? <laughs> like, it makes no sense. And obviously, Bobby with the whole meat hooks thing inside of his pecs, like, you could have just kind of climbed up that rope. Like, I like, there's no other safe measures to, like, ensure that he had to go up and climb with the hooks inside of his pecs, right? There wasn't any other safeguard. Like, kind of like how, like, Adam in the first movie tried to fake his death and then gets electrocuted as the safeguard. There's no other safeguards that we know of in that scene. So he could have just climbed up the rope and saved his girlfriend. But no, the girlfriend gets toasted alive because he's an idiot. And obviously that wouldn't work. Now, as far as Bobby goes in this movie, when we see him at the end, we don't really see what happens to him. Like, what happens to Bobby? I don't know. Maybe he'll reappear someday in another Saw film. But like... We don't even get to see where he goes after that. Does he just die there? Does he find a way out? I don't know. I will say, though, that this film also has a lot of needless deaths that don't really add much to the overall story. Um, it's just a lot of, like, traps that Hoffman sets off to try to divert or even bring the attention away from certain areas so that he can escape um, to, like, divert attention, I guess. Um, a lot of them are just, like, nothing. Like, the opening kill I brought up earlier was just a nothing burger. Uh, the fact that, like, a bunch of neo-Nazis get killed at the beginning, or not at the beginning, but, like, in this, like, garage. It's very gory, but, like, it doesn't add much again. And there's even some kills in this, me in this movie that just don't even happen. 
Like, this is the first time in the franchise that we actually get, like, a dream sequence kill. And it still doesn't make sense. Because up until this point, there was no, like, dream sequences where, like, people died because of a jigsaw trap. Even though the trap in this one is actually pretty cool, the pain train... It just overall doesn't make sense. It is probably to highlight the anxiety that Jill Tuck has in terms of being followed by Hoffman and the fear she has of being killed by Hoffman. You know, it's just there. The film itself, the, the thing that kind of ruins all of it is that the film ends kind of unceremoniously with the death of Jill Tuck being killed by the reverse bear trap, which is the first time we've actually seen the reverse bear trap actually kill someone. Which is, like, the goriest thing I've ever seen, and it's really cool. And that's where our good old buddy, Dr. Gordon, comes back into play. Because not only is he revealed to have been a secret accomplice from after he survived the initial Saw trap in the first Saw movie, but he was also called in to do various favors, such as suggest uh, the nurse from Saw 3 doing various surgeries to some of the victims to, like, you know, get them set up for their own games... And then he's also called in to be kind of the last-ditch effort, uh, the last line of defense for uh, John Kramer. If Joe Tuck ever gets harmed, it's up to <laughs> Dr. Gordon to do what he does um, and take out the person that, you know, harmed Joe Tuck. And Hoffman is left in the same bathroom as he and Adam were once in, where parts of this franchise love to come back to. And, uh, yeah, um, it's kind of unceremonious. It's, it's a decent ending, but, like, in terms of the Hoffman era, I think Hoffman's dead at this point. By the end of the Hoffman era, it just left a lot of questions about the logistics unanswered and instead favored a more soap opera-style storytelling and, and chants, which I will get back to after we go through the most current era, which is the Legacy era. No, it's not creepy at all. Now, the reason why I say Jigsaw is the start of the legacy film era is partly due to Logan and his motivation with a certain character who is very much getting artifacts of the original Saw games. Logan, in a similar fashion with previous disciples of Jigsaw, it is revealed that Logan ha was in a trap way before the events of the first film because he was he had mislabeled an x-ray result which could have helped John Kramer live if John and his doctors knew that his cancer was early on. John apparently takes him in at, uh, for a second chance because, you know, it was a simple mix-up. And so Logan is then shown the ways of the Jigsaw and is shown to be the creator of the reverse bear trap, which, yeah, it's kind of cool, but it feels like just another Saw movie, another episode to watch. But what makes the film interesting, or at least different, is John is out of the picture. This story takes place way after Jigsaw's initial games are over. What got me interested in the film early on was the fact that there appeared to be a copycat killer on the loose, and that was the main hook. But the problem is, is that... Because the killer is revealed to be a person from John Kramer's past, it feels like a lot more of the same from the previous Saw films. I feel like Spiral, because of the Jigsaw Rules website mentioned in this film by uh, Logan's assistant, that the new killer in Spiral is actually going to be influenced by the internet forums to take justice into their own hands. But we'll see what they do when we get to that on Friday. The traps this time are kind of dumb, but some are kind of basic stuff. But the victims in the first game are just the dumbest characters ever. No time to talk through traps or anything, just react to things. <laughs> Which makes some deaths early on just kind of stupid. The potato peeler trap is kind of cool though, but one of my main issues with Jigsaw is that some of the traps, like yeah, some of them are impractical, but you could have thrown some practical blood and gore effects in there. Um, obviously the final kill in this movie with, like, the lasers going through the head and making, like, a blooming onion out of, like, the, the cranium, obviously that wasn't going to be a practical effect. Like, there's no way you can use lasers to do that. Like, at all. It's kind of crazy, but you weren't going to do that. But with the potato peeler trap, I feel like you could have had some sort of, like, fake body, like, going around being cut by this whole thing with blood spewing out of it, Right? In terms of practical effects, this is one of those that has like the least amount of practical effects to me. 
And it's, you know, it's kind of sad, honestly. But I will say the final test for the initial test subjects is kind of screwed up. Like, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's like, it's like, wow, it was right there and you guys are just really dumb. Like, like it's, it's just really dumb. Like, why couldn't you think of that first, right? Now, I will say this about uh, Dr. Logan is that he is scary in a lot of other ways. He's kind of similar to Hoffman in which he wants to get, you know, justice to all the victims that have been, you know, hurt by their actions. But unlike Hoffman is that he's actually pretty smart. He uses a lot of reverse psychology to get people on their side. But he also knows a thing or two about his main victim, which is, you know, the police chief of his area. Because the police chief used his position of power, he was able to use his power and influence to basically screw up the criminal justice system. And John, and with Logan being a coroner for the police station, he kind of knows exactly how to manipulate things. Although there are some things that are like, in terms of the timeline of the franchise, just are kind of like messed up a little bit. Uh, like the fact that at the end, like Logan reveals that 10 years prior, there was a game that was played. I don't know. It, it, it's like the weirdest, like weird wet retcon of all time, but like it happens. Now, some of the other big questions that this film really poses out of the gate after the movie ends is where's Dr. Gordon? I thought Dr. Gordon was left in charge of Jigsaw's legacy or did he just like put it up for good? Like, like, did he do that? And then this movie also like reveals that John Kramer's body is not where it is. So where is John Kramer at this point? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know where John Kramer's body is. Maybe Spiral will enlighten us. Or maybe Spiral will just do its own thing. But again, not until Friday. And I, I hope that future installments maybe answer some of these questions and bring some definitive ends to some of these plot lines that are still left in the open. But I hope to God, if Jigsaw actually returns from the dead, if John Kramer returns from the dead... It would just solidify my belief that the Saw franchise is essentially a horror film version of a soap opera style TV show. Like, I swear to God. When the franchise was active in the early 2000s, no one could predict where the actual franchise would go. But looking at the franchise from a distinct point of view of it all being laid out so far... I can't help but feel like this is basically a horror version of a soap opera for horror fans such as you and me. It isn't hard to see why the franchise was initially so big in the early days since a lot of the horror films prior to Saw were campy continuations of once respected flat slasher films. From Nightmare on Elm Street to Friday the 13th to Hellraiser to all these other different key franchises from the 80s and 90s. But what caused the film series to go downward at the box office was its episodic nature at the time in later installments, including the reboot in 2017. Plus, around 2010, supernatural horror was kind of kicking around with hits like Paranormal Activity in 2010, Insidious, and The Conjuring Universe, another interconnected universe that we might talk about eventually. With Jigsaw's reemergence at the box office, it certainly allowed for more soft films to be made, Hence this week's release of Spiral from the Book of Saw. As far as what this franchise is in full, that is hard to say, considering we might never know where this web of convolution actually ends. Considering that these films are written the way they are, and the continued support at the box office, there might never actually be an end. Which is why I didn't title this film a retrospective series, since I don't think it'll ever be over. But that brings me back to one key question that I asked myself at the beginning of this review. Why do I continue to come back to this franchise? Why do I want to see more Saw? Well, to be honest, the Saw franchise isn't the most well-written thing or even the well-edited thing in the world and the performances as a whole isn't fully cohesive, but the best I could compare this franchise to is the story structure of a soap opera. Soap operas are known for corny storylines and the return of long forgotten characters that were thought to be dead. I mean, but I also come back to certain films in this franchise for cool traps or even some decent storylines I like. And as long as we get a continued story, I, I will be watching for from now on. 
It's almost like the MCU in terms of yearly releases. I just want to know the full story by the end of the day. And I guess that's all we really need when we decide what we like. Sometimes it's surface level stuff and not the deeper aspects that indie horror film points out. The Saw franchise is the textbook definition of a popcorn franchise, a popcorn horror franchise, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This is Nicholas Jennings saying, game over.